All right, so I'm recording. Um, so there's twins in the Maya myths, but there's also many twins in the Bible. There's twins in Greek myths. There's twins in the Gilgamesh epic of Gilgamesh and his twin Enkidu, and Enkidu goes down into the underworld. And I think Alvin Boyd Kuhn would agree with me here, but I argue that it's not two different people, the twins. It has to do with the higher self. We all have this experience of mm, sometimes I'm not myself, or sometimes I do things and I look back and I go, what came over me? But sometimes I get messages that seem to be like inspiration. And um, the myths are showing us something that's going on inside of us. When it has twins, it has to do with the fact that you and me have a, a divine self or a higher self that we can listen to. But a lot of times we don't listen to it or we suppress it or we get or the trauma of this world all the oppression and economic uh, traumas and other types of things can separate us from ourself to where we lose touch with who we are and the myths i believe are trying to show us that we have this higher self and to point us towards recovery of who we are um, I think they're doing that with the twins a lot, but they are these things like Halloween have to do with showing us, hey, you've been, um, you know, you've been put into this body and it's weird, but you have also a, um, there's a, the physical birth, but you have a spiritual component that you need to connect with in the second birth. You know, Christianity talks about born again, but that's just a, uh, they've, they've kind of made it into an external, oh, you have to believe in this external Jesus. I would argue that's actually a, a, a twisting of what it's trying to teach is actually trying to show you about your higher self. Your higher self can heal hurts. That's why Jesus goes around healing people. Your higher self has compassion. So it's trying to show you things about your own self, not about some historical figure named Jesus. Um, I, th I don't think there's history. I think it's uh, it's all celestial. And that's what I'm going to show a little bit about. But when when we're ready, uh, I can launch in. Was there some other things that? Nope. We we're going to. It's time to time for me to show the presentation yeah. that I wasn't able to show last time. <laughs> I apologize for that, but I think it'll work out great. Um, so I've already talked a little bit about my research has to do with this argument that I'm making based on a lot of evidence that the world's myths are connected and they're based on the stars. So I'm going to show some evidence of that. But if you want to jump in or ask questions uh, while I'm going through it, go right ahead and I'll... Um, I'll stop and, you know, I can turn off the slideshow and we can talk about it. What I wanted to do with this presentation is show some evidence, but also use some stories from different Native American sources, not necessarily the Iroquois creation story that we're going to look at, but that have examples of what I'm talking about that could be helpful as we go to the creation story that Trina is going to share with us and walk us through and and we're going to learn um, and so this will give us some tools i hope uh, as we approach that to see some of the celestial patterns because i'm convinced that you can see these patterns around the world and i'll show you some evidence of that right now so i'm going to share my screen and i was uh, i sent an email to um, trina and kyle beforehand i hope that the screen that you're seeing you can really see all the stars that i'm going to show i've got some star charts to show maybe it might be helpful to turn the lights down as i get into it a little bit later here but um before i do that i'm going to minimize this thing here so that it's not in the way 
And question? Yeah, go for it. Uh, um, with the, the world uh, miss, have you you heard you read um Joseph Campbell, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, he's, he's got a lot of uh, he makes a lot of connections between the world's myths, ancient and um and um indigenous as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing up Joseph Campbell. And, you know, I don't pretend to be the first person to notice these patterns being over and over. And it's like people have tried to figure out what's going on with some of the patterns are extremely specific, where you wouldn't expect the same specific pattern to pop up again and again around the world in cultures that are very far apart. Um, and so philosophers and psychologists and historians like Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. and also Carl Jung did a mm -hmm. lot of work on this. I'm not saying, you know, I'm fans of everything they say <laughs> or that I'm against everything they say. I'm not. I'm, I'm looking at some of the same evidence and maybe they came to different conclusions sometimes. Like Carl Jung talked about famously, well, it could be a collective unconscious uh, that keeps, that connects us all. We're unconsciously, we're connected somehow to this collective thing that, that connects us all. And I don't disagree with that. Um, but I also, they, they don't really show the connections to the stars. I'm showing, hey, these are all using some very specific system that's connected actually to constellations. So their yeah. work is important and powerful and Joseph Campbell and the hero cycle, all that stuff yeah. is, is true. I'm looking at it maybe a little bit different way without um, detracting from what they're doing, but also maybe looking at some different possible explanations than they came up with. That's a great point. Uh, about Joseph Campbell. Um, so I've studied him a little, but really not, um, you know, not, I haven't spent time to become an expert on Joseph Campbell. By yeah, me neither. I'm just interested because it was that part there where he um, he connects the, the, you know, the ancient myths and the indigenous culture, the cultural myths or legends, you know, that was just I, I came across that in my research too, so right. that's why I just mentioned I mentioned them to you. Yeah. Right. They are so connected. The connections are very deep and very yeah. amazing. Yeah. And uh, I've found, you know, lots of connections that I've written about. Even you know the Norse myths. There's some very amazing connections. You know the the there's a uh, Norse myth where there's a female troll whose name is basically Hirakin. And then in the Central American stories, there's a god, a male god, whose name is basically Hunrakan or Hurricane. And those two words are so similar. And I talk about it in my Norse Myths book, how not only are those two names similar, but I can show some evidence that they are the same constellation which is pretty amazing. And then there's mm -hmm. there's this um, tomb. It's a pretty famous sarcophagus lid of a, a king named Pakal in, in Central America, Pakal. And the lid, I don't have a picture of it here on this slideshow, but it, it shows the king. It's often like an ancient astronaut argument. This king is in between this. He's kind of on a tree of life and he's he looks like an astronaut in a space capsule, but you know the ancient astronaut people say, "Oh, this is an he's he's obviously flying a you know a space capsule." And it's like, well, why would <laughs> why would their space capsule necessarily look like a 1962 <laughs> American space capsule? That's kind of <laughs> silly. But um, <laughs> but then scholars say, "Oh, that's ridiculous. It's not a space capsule. It's him being devoured by the jaws of a." of a of a a serpent that devour you know a devouring serpent well it's really interesting because odin in the norse myths um gets devoured by the jaws of fenris the wolf and um 
and Thor gets killed by the Midgard serpent, which is, you know, the jaws of a giant serpent. And I show that those are based on constellations. And I argue in that book on the Norse myths that this scene from the tomb of Pakal is the very same constellation, um, the jaws devouring. It's some really powerful connections between cultures that you wouldn't think would have connections. And we'll see a few here. Um, and there's many, many more I could I could show, but I just, I focused on a few that I hope will help us just from what I know of the creation story, from what I've, you know, read myself, but I'm going to learn more as we go through these, these uh, 10, 10 weeks, not 10 moons, but 10 weeks of, uh, of our course. So as an introductory slide, I'm just showing some beautiful stars. I am arguing that the myths of the world, the sacred traditions given to all the different peoples of the world, it's like a priceless treasure that was given to each culture. And they're different in many ways, but they have a powerful connection. They're all celestial and they're all connected. And somehow they're all using a very ancient system that is profound and it has a lot to teach us. And so I'm really excited to be able to look at some of the sacred stories that have been preserved from the Iroquois nations. And they're, it's like, this is like an inheritance that was given to all the different peoples have this inheritance. And um, I'm convinced that they're for our benefit in this life and for our blessing and that they're positive, that they're, they're good. And they're all connected and none of them are better than any of the others. And that's something that we'll talk about right now with this figure right here. I decided to start with this individual. He's pretty famous. His name is Jean de Brebeuf, uh, Brebeuf. And he's been made into a saint. So now uh, St. John de Brebeuf, and he's actually one of the patron saints of Canada, but he was a Jesuit missionary or Jesuit, sometimes they pronounce it Jesuit, Society of Jesus, who came over in the 1600s. So pretty early. Here's his, here's his life span from 1593 to 1649. And does anyone know who he spent most of his time among? Hurons. Yeah, the Hurons. Is that what he said? Yes. Yep. Yeah, the Hurons, which I think um, there's also Wyandot. I don't I don't know the, the the name that they use for their nation, but he was mostly among the Hurons, so in the same region as the Iroquois. And does anyone know how he died? Yeah, yeah I know. I could tell the whole story. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They probably well, I, killed him. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. We probably killed them. Yeah, I didn't know until I was actually putting this slide together. I just I've referenced him in some books because he talks about a specific. Well, he talks about a few different traditions that he records, and he does it in a pretty condescending way. And so I've referenced, hey, this is a very early source. I didn't realize that he was captured by the Iroquois, and then, um, you know, they executed him. But he was over here teaching that his religion was right and everyone else's was wrong and that the bible is true and all the other stories are based on demons or you know based on error and so that whole aspect of the literalist taking these stories literally which christianity does but not only christianity you know there's people who take the bible literally um uh, you know, there's all different kinds of people who take the Bible literally, but in, in people take, there's some people who take Buddha, Buddhist stories literally or Hindu stories literally. And in every case where something is taken literally and then used um, 
to try and get the meaning out from a literal way, I would argue that's going to distort the message and even turn it upside down. Because when it becomes literal, like with the Bible, then it becomes, oh, well, you have to believe this or you're wrong. And our stories are right because they're true history and everything else is fables or whatever. It turns the message actually on its head. What these stories are, I can show is metaphors. So I'm, you know, I'm very, I think this is still a very important subject in the world today because I'm convinced that a lot of injustice and oppression is um, enabled or given like intellectual cover with literalist arguments like, oh, we're, you know, we can't have um, you know, national health care because people are inherently evil. You know, if you take the Bible literally, there there's people who teach children, you know, that, hey, everybody's sinful, you're going to go to hell. And th those kinds of beliefs, first of all, I think they're traumatizing. And second of all, they um, lead to actual you know, they, they give people excuses for doing things that are the exact opposite of what these stories I'm convinced are for. But the main reason I bring up Jean de Brebeuf is because he mentions some stories. And so he's an early source because he was living in the first half of the 1600s. These stories didn't, you know, we can't argue, oh, some, you know, some Europeans got there before Jean de Brebeuf and, and started teaching some Greek myths. And that's why these stories that have parallels to the Greek myths were among the Hurons. No, he was one of the first Europeans to get there. And when he got there, he found stories where there's parallels to the Greek myths. And, and some people today would try and dismiss that and say, well, it must have been brought by Europeans. Well, the only Europeans who were coming over were mostly these missionaries, and they were not teaching Greek myths. I don't think the missionaries were going around you know, <laughs> teaching people the Greek myths. They were teaching the Bible. So it's a really, I think, useful piece of evidence, in addition to the fact that I didn't even know what I was talking about. I didn't know the connection to the Iroquois that he was kind of right next door. I wrote a book in 2019 where I talked about some of the stories that he talks about. So here's actually from um, that book that I just showed the cover of. In This is Jean de Brebeuf's accounts from the early 1600s. Now he's being condescending and patronizing and putting down the beliefs of the people that he's coming in contact with, but he's recording for history in a pretty early century, the six, early 1600s, the ideas of the Hurons regarding the nature and condition of the soul, both in this life and after death. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this story um, that's found all the way across North America in nations all the way to the Pacific Northwest and down to the de desert in the south Southwest of this trip to the underworld to try and bring back uh, a beloved. It's a pattern that happens over and over. And it's also a pattern that we find around the world. And so he's, he's recording in this passage, he says, well, it's amusing. So already he's being like, condescending, it's amusing to hear them speak of their souls. Or rather, I should say it's a thing quite worthy of compassion. So he's saying, first of all, it's funny. But You're second of all, uh, it arouses pity because they are so mixed up about the soul. And he says, you know, it's compassionate to see reasonable men with sentiments so low. In other words, they have such a low opinion of the soul, of an essence so noble and bearing, so to speak. So he's saying, I need to, you know, I need to help them understand that the soul is, uh, you know, something higher than what they think it is. And then he, give, he gives, he goes through this kind of big long list about 
they've got all these different names for a soul. Well, that in and of itself is interesting, but it's a tangent. I won't go off on that tangent, but in ancient Egypt, they had different names for different aspects of the soul. There's the Ka, there's the Ba, there's all these different aspects of the soul. So he's recording for our, at least for history, that the Huron knew a lot of different things about the soul. And he said, and he says, you know, there's this aspect of the soul, there's this aspect of the soul. But what I'm mostly uh, moving towards is his story, his preservation of a sacred story about the soul. And I'm going to highlight it here. He's talking about this voyage of often it's a husband whose wife dies. Uh, he loves his wife very much. And this pattern, we find it in uh, different Native American nations around the country, across the whole North America. But we also find it in Japan. We find it in Greek myth. I'll talk a little tiny bit about the Greek version of it. Where the wife dies, she's still young and beautiful, and she dies, and the husband is like just beside himself with grief, and he can't help it. He knows he shouldn't do it, but he has to try and follow her down to the underworld. So here in Jean de Brebeuf is a little um, snippet from one of these versions of that story. And I highlighted here, I'll just read it out. Another told me that on the same road, so the, the husband follows this road down to the underworld. He's going to the village of the, the dead, the ghosts or the souls. He wants to find his wife. When you go down that road, you'll come to a cabin, or he says, on the same road, before arriving at the village of the dead, one comes to a cabin where lives one named Oscar Tarak. I might not be pronouncing it right. Maybe um, you, know, you, you can correct me if you know how to say it better, or maybe someone who knows Huron would know how to say it better. But the name itself apparently means Pierce Head pierce head so that's important let's just remember that who draws the brains out of the heads of the dead Ooh, that's by piercing the head and pulling the brain out and keeps them so they keep, so this 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 uh pierce head figure oscar tarak uh, lives in a cabin before you get to the village and to get to that cabin you must pass a river so i'm, I'm reading on and the only bridge you have is the trunk of a tree laid across and very, very slightly supported. So we have this pattern of a, an unstable bridge. That's, this is one version of it, a trunk that's just very slightly supported, but there's other versions of it where it's like a rope you have to cross or even a string of cotton or feathers. The passage is guarded by a dog which jumps at many souls and makes them fall. So this is also another um, aspect of this same story where there's some kind of a guardian that scares some of the you know, travelers, the ghosts of the dead or the souls to fall into the river. They fall into this river and they're carried away by the violence of the torrent. So it's like a rushing river. Okay, I, I gotta move it along because I got a lot to show. But this is these pieces of the puzzle. I'm gonna come back to some of these just to show this pattern it comes up over and over and not always the exact same characters, but almost always the same pattern where there's an unstable bridge, then there's a hut or a, a tent. Sometimes there's this figure who pulls the brains out of your head. And often there's a guardian who makes you fall into the river. In some versions of the story, not the Huron version recorded by de Brebeuf here, but um, in some versions, if you fall into the river, you turn into a salmon and, and you know, you spend the rest of eternity as a fish instead of as a human. Um, so you don't want to fall into the river. OK, so then down at the bottom. Oh, yeah, so then the brave says, but I said to him, how did you learn this news from the other world? Where would you get this story? And he says, well, persons who brought back to life have reported it. And so then he gives his commentary. Oh, the devil is deceiving them in their dreams or maybe some who having been left for dead, recover health and talk at random, and then they turn this into a story. So he's belittling and putting down this story, but actually this is extremely significant 
this is a story mm. that's found all the way across North America, but it's also found there's a, another version of the voyage to the underworld in Japan, like I mentioned. There's a version in Greek myth, which I'm going to come up with uh, and tell you a little bit about. But what's really interesting is the Native American versions have more details than the Greek version. Like this part about the souls falling into the river. That's not really in the Greek version. But um, I'm going to show that it's based on the stars. Or I'm going to argue that it's based on the stars, show you some of my arguments. And it'll help us as we go to look at the Iroquois story of creation that we're going to look at. And then down at the bottom, I just circled a little bit more of Debrebeuf's very uh, you know, negative opinion. He says, this false belief they have about souls is kept up among them by means of certain stories which the fathers tell their children, which are so poorly put together that I'm perfectly astounded to see how men believe them and accept them as truth. So, you know, I don't, I don't need to say much more about this. So it's obviously very, you know, ugly type of chauvinism to say my stories are all true and yours are all <clears throat> false or mine are all reasonable and yours are all like, you know, stories for children. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to show is they're all based on the same system. So you can't, uh, you can't say that one's, uh, you know, truer than another. They're all based on the same system, but that isn't widely known. And, um, and it's, so it's very, you know, tragic that this has happened, but also it is, uh, I, I will just bring this up that, you know, it is harder for me to analyze the Native American sacred stories because they've been, you know, filtered through people like this. Or, the, you know, Trina's going to tell us about, well, the creation story, we're going to use this version that was written down by this person, but that's because we think this is the most trustworthy. So we're already at a we're at a disadvantage as we're trying to analyze these stories because we don't have, like with the Greek myths, I can pull up the Odyssey or the Iliad, which are these big, long poems that were written down, you know, like 800 BC. And there's so many copies, even from the ancient times, that I can have a pretty good, um, a pretty good confidence that it hasn't been changed you know, because we've got lots of fragments and it's in like a long coherent story. What we have today is like a puzzle that's been scattered for a lot of cultures because of literalist Christianity, for the most part, coming through and stamping out the sacred traditions of other cultures. But so it is harder to always. So we have little sometimes little snippets that don't always fit together into a one big long story. Maybe they used to, but we can still see, I'm gonna show that we can still see the celestial patterns of those snippets. And there's some parts of the Bible which are very um, like made into a story, but there's other parts of the Bible where it's like almost like a psychedelic um, trip or a hallucination. Like if you read Revelation, <laughs> You know, it's like Revelation doesn't pretend to be a story. It's just like, then I saw this and there was a sword coming out of his mouth and then this and it, and it's, it's bizarre. And you're going, what the, th this isn't a story. This is like somebody's, you know, uh, had mushrooms, but the, those, <laughs> those images are still celestial. It's just, they haven't been so put into bad. a story. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So uh, <laughs> that's a bad mushroom trip. That ain't no good one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. Um, so you know, sometimes Can I ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this guy here, like the history of, of Christianity originally stems from the Israelites. So have people gone back to the actual Israelites? Because like us, their ways were stolen. They were built, they took all their scrolls, they destroyed all their shrines, they took and they created a false religion called Catholicism. So you have to be really careful, like when you're searching for all of this, where you go to find information, you know. 
Very, very good points. Tell me your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say it again. I, it's hard. We're all laughing. Say, Rhonda. Rhonda oh, hi. Dear. Hi, Rhonda. Nice to hi. meet you. Thank you for those points. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, very good points. I would argue <laughs> that all of the stories in the Bible including the Old Testament, are based on the stars. So I argue that Moses is a constellation. I argue that the 12 children of Jacob, Jacob had his name changed to Israel, the 12 children are quite clearly connected to the stars because there's two completely different passages where they lay out which one is connected to which constellation. Judah is a lion's whelp, and you know, Benjamin is a ravening wolf, and they're telling you, and then they're arranged in, you know, th four groups of three around a central 13th. This all has to do with the stars and the And cycle. the math. Yeah. It's the math very, that's in there, too. Yeah. yeah all the it's numbers. Really, really, it's so much deeper than the average person sees, but... You're not going to get it sitting in a, a church on a Sunday, having someone take little bits and pieces. You have to really go and do your research. So, you know, for me, it's been really hard to come out and talk to people, but I've actually gone into that area to research it. And there's some, you know, some things I do believe, but, yeah. you know, like there's things I learned from Buddhism. There's things I mm -hmm. learned from Hinduism with the chakra system, the different energies of your body. Like you're saying the different yeah. parts of your soul, yeah. you know. And then the um, Hopi had five chakras that they talk about instead of seven, but it's the same, very similar. So um, what I'm saying is they're, those are all connected. They're all connected. That's what I can show is that they're all connected. That Buddhism and Hinduism, I'll show some examples actually, but I do have I do have some online courses, not that I'm here to sell online courses that really go into the Bible and the stars, starting with the Old Testament. So I've got um, celestial it's called the Celestial Bible Tour. So no, thanks for bringing that up. It's a really I call this, you know, the biggest conspiracy in the world. But because um, there's mm -hmm. and what you're talking about, deliberately traumatizing people, I think it's clear that that's going on so um let me continue though those, those are great you. points but thank you for bringing them up and you know um what i'm trying to really establish is that they're all connected and they're all um given to different cultures for our benefit but that they can get twisted and it's mostly <laughs> it's mostly what happened was it got twisted during the roman empire and the Roman Empire turned into Europe, which became the one that, but the Europe, there was no Europeans who were originally Christian. There's no, you know, my grandfather came from Norway. The, the Norwegian, you know, well, it wasn't a state of Norway back when it got converted to Christianity, but none of them were originally Christian. This was, they had their own stories that were given to them. So this has happened over and over. It's a very important, big point. I probably opened up well, it's, a can of worms by bringing in John de Brebeuf, but um, it's... It's really important because of, with the discovery of these children who have, uh, were killed in residential schools, yeah, yeah. there is a rise in, in anger towards anything Christianity, anything church, anything like that. But when you go back to the Israelites, they have some profound knowledges, but many of our people won't look there because, oh, it's Catholic, it's Christianity, I don't want to hear it, I don't want nothing to do with it, you know? So the point that I'm making is that is not where it originally started, kind of like the Halloween show that we, uh, the Halloween movie we just saw where the origin, the, or how it originated is not what we have today oh, no. with Halloween. You know, so that's all I want to make because mm. there's there's knowledges in every culture out there. And I love what you are doing, bringing the pieces together and the similarities. 
Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rhonda. And and please, everyone, feel free to jump in. And when you do, if you if you could tell me your name, I'll try and over time uh, remember everyone's name. But thank you for bringing that up. And I do uh, agree that I think that each sacred ancient you know tradition has i think they're all teaching the same thing actually and can be shown to be teaching the same thing so you can use but you're right it's like a puzzle where some now you know maybe there's this catastrophe like kyle was talking about and the puzzle all got you know broken up and then different pieces got preserved in different places so more of one aspect got preserved here more of this aspect got preserved there and so looking at them all and starting to see how they fit together can also help us so i'll go back to sharing but thank you for bringing and i i think that you know whenever i'm going through this it, it'll be um good if people can jump in because it, it it keeps us all from falling asleep if i just drone on and on but I'm just going to throw this other um, uh, title page up. I'll get back to this a little later, but this is a uh, a really interesting long essay, almost like a mini book that was published in 1935 by a researcher whose name was Anna Gayton. And she titles it The Orpheus Myth in North America. And you can find it all online. And we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. I just want to bring up, because what I was just quoting from Jean de Brebeuf, where he talks about, well, you cross this narrow bridge, and it's a shaky bridge, and don't, you know, don't get scared by the dog or you'll fall into the river. Then you come to the hut, and there's Oscar Torich, who is called Pierce Head. He'll pierce the heads to pull out the brains. She records over and over this pattern of the myth of going down to the underworld, or she calls it the Orpheus myth. Now that's, again, that's not very nice. That's not very culturally uh, sensitive because she's saying, oh, here we have a Greek myth in North America. It's like, well, maybe we should call the Orpheus myth, you know, the, um, the retrieval of the underworld pattern in Greece. Because actually, like I said before, more pieces of the myth, more aspects, more celestial aspects are preserved in the North American versions than in the Orpheus version. The Orpheus version I'll talk about in a little bit. I'll come back to it. But I just mentioned this because she's going to give a lot more versions of the same story that Brebeuf was talking about a minute ago. So you can see down at the bottom, she lists out the pattern there's the 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 tale has to have these kind of, or it almost always has following the deceased the hero gets some supernatural aid the he he comes in contact with the, you know other deceased or his beloved who says hey go back you, you can't come here the journey is towards the west and then she's got some other things on the next page but she's going to be very useful in showing this you know recording this pattern and she shows how it's all the way across America. And her name was Anna H. Gayton. And she uh, wrote this and published this in 1935. And if you want to look it up, I'll just put it on here. Now it's recorded. So hopefully we're still recording. Um, you can look this up and see the, uh, the, you can find that volume 48 from July, September, 1935. So I'll come back to that. Now I want to talk about she doesn't say, hey, these are all based on this celestial worldwide system. I'm saying that. But there have been other people who have said that myths are connected to stars before. It's not like I'm the first person to say it. But the problem is a lot of people don't know the constellations. And I think we've been given actually some bad outlines of the constellations. And that's what I want to I want to just briefly mention why I use the outlines that I do. And I'm well aware that cultures around the world have their own constellations. The Native American different nations have their own way of connecting the stars. The peoples of the Pacific have their own ways of connecting the stars. The peoples of 
China and Japan, they have their own constellations. So what's, um, you know, right away, someone might say, well, you can't say that they're all based on the same system because everyone has a different way of connecting the stars, which I acknowledge. Everyone does have a different way of connecting the stars. But as I show in my books, there seems to be an ancient way that connects across the world. Don't, don't ask me exactly how it happened. I think, you know, the catastrophe that Kyle was talking about has something to do with it. There was probably a system before the catastrophe and then the puzzle all got scattered and then things went in all kinds of different directions. But I'm gonna show you, first of all, the terrible ways that we are shown the constellations today. This is good old Wikipedia showing you a constellation that's a really important constellation we call it Hercules. Obviously, that's a Greek mythological character, but this figure shows up over and over. But this is just a terrible, terrible outline. Like, what is that? It's like, <laughs> could you find that in the sky? Yeah, you could probably find it anywhere in the sky because it's so random. I'm going to show it a little bit better. Um, I'm going to just cut to a black background with some stars. Hopefully you can see that. You may need to turn off the lights where you are, but I hope that your screen is good enough. Can you see that? It looks like a weird bug that someone mm -hmm. stepped on. I mean, it's like, how are, you gonna, how are you gonna see Hercules in that? Like, what the heck is that? How are you gonna even remember that thing? It's not helpful. And here's another uh, constellation called Sagittarius. This is again, right out of Wikipedia. There's a bunch of stars. They're connected by random lines. It's useless. That is a useless, <laughs> I would say, a useless effing outline. It is not going to help you find the stars in the sky. You're not going to be able to find Sagittarius with that. And you're certainly not going to be able to see how the Bible or the ancient myths are based on, you know, there's certain figures in the myths that are connected to Sagittarius. There's certain myths that are uh, figures that are connected to Hercules. But with these outlines, you'll never see it. And that might be on purpose. It might be on purpose. But there was a great author, one of my favorite authors who changed my life. Kyle probably knows who I'm about to talk about, just briefly. I've talked about it more in other places. His name was H.A. Ray. Who's heard of H.A. Ray? H.A. Ray. H.A. Ray and his wife, Margaret Ray. They're famous because they wrote a book in like 1946 called Curious George. H. A. Ray wrote Curious George. And his wife. <laughs> and his wife wrote Curious George. And he's the most important author, almost most important of all time. <laughs> like one of the, because to me, because he wrote also wrote this book in 1952 called The Stars, A New Way to See Them, where he he complained about the exact same thing I just illustrated to you. He said, the way that we're shown the stars is super unhelpful. We either get these super flowery outlines that you can't find in the sky. You know, they'll, they'll draw this like beautiful woman and say, yeah, that's Virgo. And then you go out in the sky and you're like, well, uh, you know, how do I see that? Or they'll do this <laughs> random bunch of lines like I just showed you that it's like, what the heck? I can't remember that. I, you know, I certainly can't find it in the sky. So he said, hey, there's a happy medium where I don't get too flowery, but still what I'm going to draw looks like what it's supposed to be. And he called it, there's the picture. You can still buy this book. I actually recommend everybody buy it. The stars, a new way to see them. But I suspect that he may have known, I argue that this book could also be called The Stars, a very, very ancient way to see them. Because I'm going to show you some ancient artwork that lines right up with the way he outlined. So he said, here's how I recommend outlining Sagittarius. Now remember that, that last Sagittarius I showed you, I can't even remember what it was, it was such a jumble. But this is like, archer. wait, ah, I see, oh, Sagittarius, yeah. it is an archer. There is a bow in the sky. There's also some other characteristics, kind of a, a long dress, uh, looks like kind of walking in one direction, but looking back the other direction, a long kind of plume coming out the top of the head there. All these distinctive characteristics we can find in the myths and in ancient artwork. I'm going to show you some. So here's me. 
back when I was younger, back in 2016. And I'm in Boston at the Museum of Fine Art, a great museum. And they have this beautiful vase there. You can see how big it is next to me. This is from ancient Greece. And this is one of my favorite paintings to show the connection <laughs> to the stars. I love this one. This is a myth called Acteon. And just in the interest of time to kind of move along, I'm going to talk a little faster about it. I could just kind of, you know, tell the whole story and everything. But in this myth, Acteon, he stumbles across the goddess while she's bathing. Her name is Artemis. Anyone heard that story? She's bathing. Could you say the name again? Artemis. Artemis is the goddess. She's, she's the goddess there with the bow and arrow. She's actually a moon goddess. And she's a goddess of the hunt. She's a virgin goddess, but she, in Greek myth, she attends every childbirth. The women in labor pray to Artemis in ancient Greece to uh, allow them to deliver the baby, which is very interesting that there's a virgin goddess present at the birth. See, it's really interesting, these connections that show up virgin birth shows up over and over in different places. But um, anyway, this is Artemis slaying Acteon because the poor he's a prince poor Acteon he was just out hunting for deer with his buddies and after the day of hunting they had gotten a few deer he decided hey it's all hot and everything I'm going to go wander in the cool of the woods and he wandered where he shouldn't have wandered he wandered over to a, a grove a stream where the water was in a nice pool there and the goddess Artemis was naked bathing in the pool with her nymphs that attend her and uh poor Acteon was so overwhelmed by her beauty that he could just he didn't know what to do he just like stared with his mouth open and he just kind of just stood there not saying anything and she said what's the matter with you yeah you're not supposed to be staring at a goddess and she splashes water on him and says doesn't sound like you're able to talk why don't you go tell your friends that you saw the goddess Artemis bathing naked, um, you know, since you obviously have such bad manners. And as she splashed the water on him, he, if you know the story, he turns, he starts to turn into a deer and he tries to say something, but he finds he can only bleat out like a deer noise. And then he wonders why he's so terrified. Well, because he's turning into a deer and deer, are, you know, they run away at everything. And he finds himself bounding through the woods and he can't, he can't understand why he's leaping so quickly. And then his own hunting dogs catch the smell of a deer, which is actually acting on, and they start chasing him. And he's like, oh no, my, my dogs are chasing me. And he tries to call to them, but he can't because he's turned into a deer and they tear him to pieces. So this ancient artist has depicted this scene, but he's done it actually, or he or she, we don't know who the artist was. They just call the artist the pan painter. Um, because of they named these artists after whatever their most famous painting was or whatever they identified him with or her. We don't know who painted it. They just say the pan painter. But um, this artist actually depicts Artemis as fully clothed and Acteon is basically more naked. And he's not actually turned into a deer, even though in the story it's quite clear he turns into a deer. So it's almost like well, maybe he turned into a deer just in his mind. You know, maybe this is just psychological. But his dogs are obviously eating him. Um, but uh, this is from this is from actually a, a you can find this whole book online. This is one of the scholars who was really into Greek vases, John Beasley, and he wrote this book in 1918. Attic, which is Greek, red figured vases in American museums, published in 1918. You can find it online. So I put the title up there if anyone wants to go look at. You know, this is on page uh, 113, you can find this picture. But that that's what he's drawing. But does anyone see any resemblances to Sagittarius? I'm gonna show you Sagittarius in a second. Here, can you see the stars? Can you see the constellations here? Mm -hmm. Are you guys able to see it okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the resolution's good enough? Good, because I, I really hope yeah. I can show this. This is the Milky Way that I've outlined here. The beautiful Milky Way. The whole Milky Way is a big ring, but the brightest part, that's the part that's near, that's the part that I'm showing right here. This is the brightest part of the Milky Way. So one side of the Milky Way is the brightest part. And that's the pool that the goddess was bathing in. 
uh, the, the Milky Way can play lots of different roles in myths. It can be a river. It could be smoke from a fire. It could be um, the seashore where the waves are making, you know, the white foam of the sea. It plays all these different things in different myths. But in this story, this brightest part that I just circled there, that a lot of times becomes like a grotto or a, a pool, a wide you know, pool where a goddess will be bathing in Greek myth, for, for example. So here's Sagittarius again, a little smaller, but hopefully you can see it. She looks kind of like she's walking one. Now, I say she, all the constellations can play both male characters and female characters in different myths. It's like they take on different personas. But this is uh, Sagittarius again. And I'm going to show how Sagittarius... This artist is giving us very clear clues that he believes that Artemis is connected to Sagittarius. And I, I would agree with this artist. Uh, like I said, I don't know if it's a he or a she. If I said he, um, the artist, the pan painter from ancient Greece, 400 BC or so. And Sagittarius is right next to Scorpio. This is Scorpio right here. We'll, we'll see some other stuff about Scorpio. But look at the bow look at the angle of Actaeon. look at scorpio look at the angle of sagittarius i'm going to make it a little bigger there's the milky way off to the right here's sagittarius i'm just going to try and briefly show this is ha rays outline from the stars a new way to see them but this is a very ancient painting showing that this is a very ancient way to see them also and there's scorpio and here we have Look at Artemis in the painting. Look at the angle of Sagittarius, the, the constellation. I would argue that that constellation itself looks like it's walking one way. See how it kind of looks like the constellation's going that way, like the knees are pointing that way. But then mm -hmm. it's looking back the other way. Looking back the other way. See that? Shooting back the other way. Now look at, look at, Artemis in the painting. She's walking one way and she's looking back and shooting the other way, just like the constellation. And look at her feet. Like the artist puts her feet almost like in the exact same position. And even like the angle of her knee right there, just perfect match with Sagittarius. And then, of course, there's the angle of the bow. It's not like she's holding it, you know, straight up by her face or anything. She's holding it almost like gangster style, right? <laughs> and then look at Sagittarius. There's another constellation, Orion. Orion holds the bow much more up. Sagittarius holds the bow much more like this. So look at how similar the bow angle is in both the constellation and the artwork. And here's really, to me, one of the clinchers of this whole thing. On her back, if you look at the artist from ancient Greece has painted on the back of the goddess, She's got some kind of a, looks almost like a samurai sword, but it's probably like a quiver for her arrows or something. I'm talking about this thing right here. And it even has like a little tassel on top. See that? The artist has put that thing there. And now look over at Sagittarius. There's this, that line that's part of the constellation shows up in different myths in different ways. Like in Norse myths, um, Odin hangs himself or in the Bible Judas hangs himself now can you see how it's possible that Sagittarius looks like a figure being hanged by the neck where that thing is the rope or it could be like a feather it could be it could play lots of different things um, but I would argue that this is very strong evidence that some ancient artist <laughs> knew this outline system a long time before H.A. Ray ever wrote this book. And even look at the angle of Acteon is like the angle of Scorpio. And the arm, the Scorpio, I draw it with like multiple heads because a lot of times Scorpio will play a serpent with multiple heads. But in this case, Acteon's kind of got his arms flung out. But look at the, the curly Q tail of this dog right here is biting into his side. Now, over here on this, right next to Sagittarius, in the right spot, there's a constellation right next to Sagittarius called the Southern Crown. 
Corona Australis or the Southern Crown. And it's right there. Like it's perfect for the curly Q tail that that artist put in there. So I would argue that that's pretty, you know, good visual example of what I'm talking about, how the, the ancient myths are actually based on the stars. So I'm going to show some more um, and try and relate it to the uh, the story that I was talking about of this journey down to the underworld and try and bring in some things that'll be helpful as we go into the Iroquois creation story. But I also want to return to this Hercules constellation, super important constellation, super bad outline right here from Wikipedia. So let's get rid of that and show you a better outline. This is how H.A. Ray outlines the constellation that we call Hercules, but plays a lot of different figures in different myths around the world, not always Hercules. Yes, this constellation does play the character of Hercules. That's one mythical character, but lots of other characters too. Not always males, but a lot of times a male character is Hercules. Let me show you some examples. Here's an ancient Greek uh, piece of artwork of the god Zeus, who's actually the father of Hercules in the myths. And we know it's Zeus because the ancient artist or the friend of the ancient artist who knew how to write put Zeus right there. So there's Zeus. It's it, right in front of his nose. There's some Greek writing that says Zeus. Now look at the similarities again. I hope you can see them. There's, and I will blow it up a little bit bigger in a minute. But deep knee bend, like a lunge, carrying a powerful weapon in one hand raised up overhead and then reaching out with other hand. You see that? Mm -hmm. Also big square beard, like Zeus has a big square beard. Hercules, the constellation has a big square head. So a lot of times a, Zeus, uh, a Hercules figure will have a beard, but not always. Like I said, they can play female characters like the, the Gorgons in ancient Greece. They have serpents coming out of their head. And if you look at ancient artwork, they kind of have like a it's almost like the serpents form a square beard all the way around their head. I would say that they're a lot of times depicted in a Hercules posture, even though they're female characters. So these characters, these constellations can show up as different things. But what's really interesting to me is this deep knee lunge bend. We see it over and over in artwork around the world, including in the Americas. This one's from a Maya cup of a god named Chalk. He's a rain god. We'll, we'll look at this one a little closer. But also, if you look at that big um, in Tiwanaku, which is down in Bolivia, the sun gate, there's lots of little figures around the sun gate who are in the same posture. But look at Chalk, deep lunge, also carrying a weapon over his back. I'll show it in bigger, I'll, I'll blow it up a little bit later. But I'm just showing that Greece, Americas, what's going on? We've got the same kind of pattern showing up in the leg, the, the like one arm reaching forward, the legs are in almost the exact same position. And then here we have in India, this is the god Indra. And I'm not talking about the bigger god in the center, but above that god in the center, there's a smaller god who's actually a rain god pouring rain down on that figure in the center. And that is Indra. Indra is the rain god of ancient India. And that's Indra. That's how, uh, that's how they've identified, you know, that's Indra pouring rain down on, it's actually Vishnu in the center. I'm going to blow it up a little bit bigger so you can see Indra is in that same posture. See that posture? <laughs> Look at the legs. Look at the legs. And one arm is reaching forward. Now, in this case, he's not holding a weapon over his head. But look, he doesn't have a big square beard, but he's got kind of a funny shaped hat that's almost like square, but plus it's got a little cone on top. But another thing to notice, this is a really interesting aspect. Look at Indra, what's he wearing? He's wearing kind of like a sash and look at how the sash kind of billows out behind him, kind of, you know, behind his butt there. He's got like part of his uh, sash is flung out there and it curls into a little curly cue at the end. You see that? I'll make it flash there. Okay. <laughs> now, what's interesting is, let's look at chalk. Now, remember, Indra, that Indra is from like India. Actually, I think this carving might be from uh, 
Cambodia and from like the region of, uh, of uh, oh, what's that famous temple there? It's, it's escaping my mind, but. Uh, uh, Angkor Wat. Yes, Angkor Wat. Uh, I think this might be from that region, but in any case, this is from Asia. And then all the way over here in the Americas, look at Chalk. Well, first of all, his leg position, very similar to Indra's leg position, very similar to Zeus's leg position. But does he have behind his butt a sash coming out? He's wearing like a knotted belt or something. But look at the sash right there. Can you see that? I'll make that. Yeah. And it ends in kind of a tuft. Now, if you've seen pictures of Hercules, you know, the hero Hercules, he's always wearing a lion skin. And a lot of times the tail of the lion skin is hanging out in the exact same place with a tuft. I didn't put one in this slideshow, but if you go look for ancient artwork of Hercules, you'll find it. And here's Zeus. Now he's not wearing a sash that comes off of his waist, but he's got like a sash over his shoulders, interestingly enough. And then there's, look at that. There's kind of like, it's got, instead of one tuft at the end, it's got two little thongs at the end. What's going on? Well, I would argue, look at, look at the Hercules in the center again. There's a very bright star right above the hip of Hercules. I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle it. If you look above Hercules, you know, the figure, he's got one arm reaching out, deep lunge. Above his waist, straight up is a bright star right there. That's called Vega. And that's what I would argue these ancient artists all around the world are using. And I could show example after example from different artwork from different cultures of this going on. That's Vega, the star Vega. It's in a constellation called Lyra, which is a lyre, you know, which is like kind of a miniature harp that they used to play. But um, we'll look at, it's important. Lyra is important for, I'm gonna show a Native American story. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go on for much too, too, too much longer, but I just wanna try and show this evidence. Look at this. I love how chalk, He's a rain god, just like Indra is a rain god. Zeus is obviously a thunder and lightning and rain and storm god. Chalk is a rain god. I love how it lines up with the constellation Hercules. I'm going to show it here. He's a rain god. He's got the same lunge posture. Oh, the heel is always raised in these, just like you can see the heel in the constellation. I'm going to show the constellation on top of Chalk in a second. He's holding a weapon over his back. In this case, it's an ax. Sometimes it's a thunderbolt in different myths. Sometimes it's a thunder hammer like Thor of Norse myths. Um, in Chalk's case, it's an ax. There's a god from Africa named Shango, who's also associated with the same constellation I've argued. Shango has a big beard. Shango also carries an ax. I didn't show a picture of him here, but you can look him up on the internet. Uh, his name is spelled, sometimes starts with an X-A-N-G-O, Shango, or sometimes S-H-A-N-G-O. They spell it different ways. But Shango also has an X. He's associated with the same constellation. He's also a thunder. Uh, well, his wife is more of the thunder goddess, but um, associated with, see how these patterns keep repeating around the world. So there's his X. I just drew a line pointing to the X head. And he's got this forward reaching arm. In this case, he's grabbing this circular disc. And if you go to the Met, this is in the Met in New York City, this uh, cup from the Maya. It was thought to have been made around 700 or 800, the year 700 or 800. And the, and the sign actually in the Met says, scholars are arguing about what this disc is. They don't know what it is. Well, I like to, you know, pat myself on the back and, and be um, not humble and say, I know what it is <laughs> because it's a constellation. It's a constellation. I'm going to show you. Um, they don't know. They can't figure out what it is, but what it is is a constellation that I'm going to show you. But also, I'm just going to point out his, uh, you know, his sash around his waist. So now let's, loin cloth has a tuft at the end there. Now let's look at the constellation Hercules. I'm going to bring it in here in a second. Where is it? Come on, Hercules. 
think my presentation is stuck. Here he comes. All right, there it is. All right, so there's the same outline of Hercules. I've got it on a white background, so it really shows up because I'm going to make it fade in and out with chalk. Look at the lunge. Look at the legs. Look at the arm reaching out. Look at the star vega kind of to the left of his hips there. Now let's bring in chalk. There's Hercules. Let's bring in the, oh, there's, this is the constellation. Very beautiful, visible, pretty easy to spot. Corona Borealis, which means Northern Crown. Very close to the constellation Hercules. And you can imagine Hercules reaching out to grab. And in some myths, it's important. Hercules will be grabbing things like a baby sometimes. I know it doesn't look like a baby, but you know how babies sometimes arch? Um, sometimes there'll be like a grandfather figure who will grab a baby to rescue it. And that's Hercules grabbing Corona Borealis. But in this Maya artwork, look at how close the disc that he's holding is to Corona Borealis. Look at his legs. Look at how, I mean, it's perfect. Even the, the tough, the tough doesn't go exactly to Vega, okay? But it's really close. His, his legs, his arms, his, you know, Corona Borealis is in just the right place. It's very clear, I would argue, anyone should be able to agree with me that these gods who are associated with thunder and rain around the world are associated with the same constellation. It's weird. And yes, I know that these, these cultures have different ways of outlining the stars, but there seems to be a memory of these figures that are associated with rain or with wind or with lightning are associated with this constellation. It's like an ancient memory. And there's Vega um, in Lyra the Liar. We'll talk about Lyra in a second. I just want to show one more example. This is from, you know, the when the missionaries, actually the Spanish conquistadors came over to Central America, they basically gathered up all the Maya texts and burned them. This is one of the few, I think there's maybe only like eight surviving Maya texts. This is one of them. This one is in, it made its way to Europe, you know, at some point. I think this is the Dresden Codex. So eventually it wound up in basically modern day Germany. But that is a picture from the Dresden Codex. And look at this. We've got, again, a kneeling posture with a heel up. Doesn't have a big, huge beard, but does have a square-shaped head. See how there's a headdress that makes the head look square? And look at that thunderbolt that he's carrying. Now, I know he doesn't have it over his back, but the shape of that thunderbolt is very similar to the th shape of the thunderbolt of Zeus not to mention the fact that they're both in the exact same posture. And if you look closely, that Maya god um, on his shoulder is actually a big eagle or a big bird of prey. It's kind of hard to see, but Zeus is also associated with an eagle too, because there's an eagle constellation right next to the constellation that these two gods are associated with. So this is just very clear evidence of some kind of connection around the world. So there's Hercules again. I just wanted to show. Now there's Lyra. It's like a it's like a harp or you know um, uh, a harp or a uh, well a lyre um, or a guitar. It's kind of like a little a guitar without a neck. It's just the strings on a frame. So why am I bringing all this up? Well, one to show these connections. There's Vega. I'm trying to remember what I'm going to segue over to a myth here for us. Oh yeah, there's. Um, oh yeah, I know what I'm going to do now. I'm going to talk a little bit about this pattern of going down to the underworld. Then I'm going to look at one or two other um, Native American myths that might have some clue, some tools to help us as we launch into the Iroquois story of creation. This, this. Um, outline that we saw for Artemis, the goddess, walking one way and looking back the other way, walking one way, looking back the other way. There's this story of Orpheus that I mentioned. 
Orpheus has to go get his beloved from the underworld in the myths of ancient Greece. Orpheus is a super important figure. Actually, he plays the lyre. He plays the harp. He's the musician who's so talented, he can even make the rocks weep if he wants to when he starts to play. He can play a sad song and all of nature will start to weep. And so he falls in love with a beautiful maiden named Eurydice. Eurydice. And on her wedding day, she steps on a serpent. She's walking through the fields with her, you know, bridesmaids or whatever. On, she's so happy she's going to get married that day. She steps on a serpent, poisonous, dies, goes to the underworld. Orpheus is distraught. It's the exact same pattern that Anna Gayton was writing about that she found in all these different North American nations. Orpheus can't leave it alone. He can't just say, oh, well, snake bite. I guess I can't marry Eurydice. No, he's got to go down to the underworld. He takes his harp with him. He goes down to the gods of the underworld and he pleads. He says, please, please. I love Eurydice so much. Won't you please let her come back with me? He plays his harp and they say, Orpheus, Orpheus, we see that you are distraught. Your, your music has moved our hearts. You may lead her back to the land of the living on one condition, on one condition, you've got to trust us. Do not look back. She's going to walk behind you all the way, all the way. And do not look back to see if she's coming because that will show that you don't trust her. If you look back, she's going to stay with us. But if you get her all the way back to the land of the living, then she can be your wife and go back to from the dead. And Orpheus says, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I really, really will not let you down. And he starts up the trail. And there's other paintings of Eurydice following behind him. I just show this one, the horrible moment, of course. All the whole way, he's like, is she back there? She's not making any noise. Of course, she's, you know, she's in the realm of the dead. So she's almost like a ghost. But if she can get back to the world, she'll be okay. She'll be his wife. She'll come back from the dead. But she's not making any noise right now. And he's just torn with uh, doubts. He can't decide, should I look back? No, I can't. I can't look back. They won't let her come out if I look back. He gets all the way up. And he's like, I'm not going to look back. He doesn't. He gets all the way up and there's like a, a, a pretty big step to get up from the underworld path to the land of the living. So he climbs up and he goes, oh, this, this is, she might need some help. And he turns around and then he realizes he turned around too soon. He turns around to help her. And the last thing he sees is Eurydice disappears back into the underworld. It's the most sad, oh, oh. and that's it. He's okay. gone. It's horrible. There's all kinds of paintings and sculptures down through the centuries of this horrible story. But it's the same pattern of the unsuccessful retrieval from the underworld. But also it has patterns of don't look back. Does anyone remember in there, there's a Bible story where someone can't look back. Anyone know? Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. Who says? Who said that? I can't, I can't see because I got my slides up here. But 10 points for... Who was that? Rhonda. Rhonda. <laughs> Rhonda. <laughs> Been to Sunday school before. Uh, that's right. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, who is it that looks back? It's a terrible story. Oh, I forget her name. Lot's she, wife. She doesn't get a name. Yeah, she just gets called Lot's wife. <laughs> but <laughs> Lot, Lot is the one righteous man who's going to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah and the angels say, listen, don't look back. We're going to destroy that city. And Lot says, okay, I won't. And he leads his daughters there. This is a painting from like the 1300s. She turns to a pillar of salt. <laughs> she turns it. As a kid, I was like, oh, that's the most terrifying thing ever. Um, <laughs> things they teach children out of the Bible. But she, she had to look back. She couldn't not look back. Why is that a pattern? Because remember, mm -hmm. Sagittarius is walking one way, looking back the other way. So there's all these myths about don't look back. Um, and I'll show you another um, picture of it. This is by a famous artist named Gustave Doré. I'm pretty sure this is Gustave Doré, woodcut. 
you can see her looking back at the flames of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is a little more modern than the last one. There's Lot's wife looking back. He's got her with a big pitcher, which would suggest the constellation Aquarius. I don't know why he did that, but she's clearly walking one way, looking the other. Even her foot looks just like the foot of Artemis. And then look at Lot. See, she doesn't get a name. She just gets called Lot's wife. But look at Lot. He's got the two daughters on either side. I just want to point this out. I'm going to introduce you to a constellation that's got a central body and then two like serpent halves on either side. It's called Ophiuchus. I'm going to show it in the next um, slide because it's an important one. But I believe that Lot and his two daughters is probably Ophiuchus, the central body with the because it's right next to basically Sagittarius. But in between Ophiuchus and Sagittarius is the Milky Way, the Milky Way. See, that's the fire and brimstone that gets rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Milky Way can play different things. It can play a pillar of fire. It can play a pillar of cloud. It can play um, fiery uh, destruction raining down from heaven. Like there's a Chinese myth of a heavenly emperor who's going to rain down fiery destruction on the people because they stole his favorite bird. Um, again, it's like Zeus with his eagle or that Maya um, codex with the eagle. They stole his favorite fire bird, so he's going to rain fire down on the people just like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's all celestial, I'm arguing. And here's where it is in the heavens. And I'm going to show Pierce Head as well, the one who takes the brains out. Here's that bright part of the Milky Way that I talked about. Here's Sagittarius, who's walking one way, looking the other way. And now I'll take that circle out of the way. I'm going to show Ophiuchus now. See how Ophiuchus is on the other side? There's actually, a in the book of Revelation, there's an angel who has one foot in the ocean and one foot on land. That's also Ophiuchus. See how Ophiuchus has one foot in the Milky Way, one foot not on the Milky Way? See these these constellations. These are I'm showing like some of the most important ones because these will show up in our Iroquois story of creation. Um, Ophiuchus is a super super important constellation. So I'm introducing it. See how it's got a central body. It's almost shaped like a tombstone or like a house. Can you see how it's mm -hmm. like a house? Like how children draw a house, like a square mm -hmm. with a triangle. So remember in the um, story of uh, Jean de Brebeuf, there was a, a hut. Remember when you get across the river, there's a there's a hut or a cabin there. And that's where Osco Tarach is there to pull the brains out from the people who die so they won't remember their last life. Here's a few pages from Orpheus Myth in North America. I just want to show how much good work Anna Gayton did. This thing goes on for pages and pages, but she records a lot of these stories of the journey to the dead and she calls it the Orpheus myth but like I said there's even more stuff that are preserved by the Native American versions of this than the Orpheus story that I kind of told you when I was showing that picture here's all the different places that it's that she she points out you know if you were to zoom in on this you could see all the way up in the Pacific Northwest and she's got the Seneca the Huron up there, Jean de Brebeuf encountered that story of the, you know, the road down to the underworld. Down in the south, the Cherokee, the Navajo and the Zuni in the southwest. Uh, all across America and North America and really all around the world. Um, it's really fascinating and important because it shows a connection. It shows a connection. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's five to nine. Oh, we I got to finish up. We, we didn't take a break all evening. Oh. I can see everyone is like Sorry. We're coming to the end of our energy here. Mm -hmm. Um, this is so interesting, and everyone is wondering if we could get uh, uh, copies, I guess, of your yeah. Yeah. what you've shown us so far. Um. The Jesuit thing. The, yeah, the Jesuit, uh, the Brave of stuff. 